Hi there, come on in. I have a confession to make. I'm not here. I mean, I'm not even in Michigan. I'm up in Manitoba. Here's a problem. Gunaseo Lake, where they catch these big 8, 10, 12 pound walleyes in the spring, they seem to spread out in the lake and they can't find them nearly as well late July. So we took Mark Martin, Michigan walleye ace, up there to find out where those walleye are. I mean, it's a miserable job. Somebody's got to do it, and I volunteered to help. What can I say? Tonight, we're going to show you some red hot bluegill fishing. We're going to take you fishing for salmon 1985, those good old heydays. We've got a great show, so stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. Oh, it's left. Oh, got him. What? You got him? Oh. Okay. Get that lamprey. Oh, he's got a lamprey on it. Oh, oh get a load of that. Okay. I'll be darned. Look at Pull that. Pull some line out. Pull some line out. As far as the eye can see, corn, wheat, beans, great looking farm country. You don't think of this as being a fishing country at all in the fall. There's pheasants out here, rabbits, lots of deer. No streams really meandering through, occasionally dotted with a farm pond here and there. That's, that's the beauty of this place. In the fall, this would be great for ducks. And we know right now it is great for big bluegill. Fishing farm ponds is fun because it's so easy. Casting a worm and a bobber from shore is something anybody can learn, and action can be fast. There we go. Nice one. Um, a bigger bass. Yeah, bigger bass. That's trouble. You got to get past these little ones to get down to those big bluegill. Well, I got him in the in the weeds, but he's put my D hooker away here. Yep. There we go. Well, this is the biggest bass so far. Now, he also swallowed the hook, so he's going to get the D-hooker treatment. Yeah, just put it down like that. You ready? Pull the trigger, and off goes the bass. Amazing. Isn't that amazing? Don't have to touch it. No muss, no fuss. <laughs> <laughs> it chops, it grinds. It makes pizzas. <laughs> well, it really doesn't do all that, but the happy D-hooker has been around for years. You simply slide it down the line to the hook. Pull the line parallel to the shaft and tighten it up a little bit, and when you pull the trigger, the hook comes out and the fish falls. The way it works is similar to the old-fashioned hook degorger, except that to activate it, you don't have to touch the fish. Ultralight tackle with small lures can work in a farm pond, especially one like this that's loaded with small bass, and you can make those little ones feel like trophies. What do you think, John? Should I use the orange crankbait or the little F4 flatfish? I like the F4 flatfish. F4 flatfish. Okay, now we put this one on deck. That's the way I, I like to do. So this one can be uh, ready to go as soon as I'm done with the flatfish, which like three fish. I think, and then I'll switch to the next one. Working different baits is part of the fun of fishing, especially when you can see the fish chase them. We're moving right through here. I'm gonna, oh, they're still coming. Cast out this little flatfish. Now it's a floater. I think you're gonna find, when I crank it, there they come. Yeah, they'll hit it when it sets. They'll bump it. Yeah, I can gather a crowd with it. Now I'll toss it out there now that I have the, the little ones all concentrated in one spot. I'll go out here and see if I can get a big one. The problem is trying to get this lure down. God, look at him. <laughs> it's terrific. It's terrific. Oh, a lure like this is great. I, I wish it sank a little deeper. This is a lip-hooked bass, easy to unhook from the crankbait. Watch him disappear when I toss him back. <laughs> Fishing a little deeper would get the lure down to where the bigger fish tend to hang out. A jig with a twister tail is perfect for this. The tail attracts fish, and you can pull it along the bottom where all kinds of fish will suck it up, thinking it's some kind of bottom-dwelling critter. One problem of farm ponds is all that algae and water weeds that sometimes chokes ponds like this because of all the fertilized fields on all sides. Now, this jig got hung up and dangled from a weed where a bluegill slammed it. Big ones don't usually chase a lure like this, but there were two of them side by side vying for the bait. 
Normally, a bluegill moves in slowly and sucks in its prey. Not when there's competition, though. Oh, yeah, that's a bluegill. Oh, did you see that? The okay. classic panfish bait. Half a night crawler on a number six hook. Now, this is the kind of meal they like to suck in. You don't get to see this usually. It all happens under the bobber, and you've probably been wondering all these years what's going on under there. Why does it go down, but you set the hook <laughs> and nobody's home? Well, here's what happens. A bluegill moves in on a large, whole night crawler. It sucks in one end only because the crawler is too big. If your hook isn't on that end, when you yank the line, you'll come up empty-handed or empty-hooked. So let's try a smaller worm now, not a big night crawler. That's how the hook ends up way down the bluegill's mouth, and now you know what's going on underneath your bobber. Oh, there we go. It's okay, loose now. Now every fish has gotten in those weeds right there. There we go. I don't think it's a, no, it's not a bad gill at all. No, it's a very good gill. Maybe I should. I always want to knock one of these off on camera. Yeah. Well, if you, if you knock this one off, you will join a very large fraternity of fishermen. One more farm pond fishing tool, a long-handled net to get past those shore weeds. Okay, we got to take it. Here it is. Ah, oh, look at this bluegill. <laughs> Well, they're around, maybe in a forgotten pond near you. Small lures will attract little bass. Jigs might work better for larger ones, but a worm and a bobber is tough to beat. And if a bluegill will take a whole night crawler, hey, you've got a big one. Here's one of the big bluegill I caught. It's frozen, wrapped in wet cloth, and so it's protected. Taxidermist Tim Hayes will be getting onto this pretty soon. But I think we ought to take a little lesson here in bluegill identity. Here's a bluegill. This is one I caught from Houghton Lake. Characteristic black bars, dark bars on the side. Uh, it has a black gill flap right there. And of course, bluish under the gills. Now, why do I tell you this? Because not every fish that looks like a bluegill is. Take the case of Chip Drotos. This is a green sunfish as well. This is what these huge ones look like. That's it. Man, this is not just the state record. Not just the state record, but this is a world record green sunfish. How about that? Well, Chip, you were casting a mama's cat yeah, I had a uh, little time after work one day and uh, went out to the lake uh, very near our home. Had a paddle boat out there, and uh, I have a cousin that says, I spend $25,000 on a bass boat, go 30 and 40 miles, and you want 200 yards and got a world record fish. And uh, I was out there and uh, cast it off just uh, a few times, pulled it up, and a neighbor happened to be on the shore and said, uh, what do you have there? I said, pretty big bluegill. So that's what I thought it was. And he said, I don't think that's a bluegill. So he went up and got his DNR book, took a look at it, and he said, uh, why don't we take it up to the market? So uh, we put it in a bag, and kept it alive, and went up to the market and asked the folks if we could uh, weigh it there. They were a little surprised. It was a meat market. And uh, took it up. They were kind enough to let us do that. The next morning, I was at the DNR, and the DNR uh, lady greeted me at the door. It was the one over in Livonia and said, I've uh, been working here for four or five years, and this is the second uh, record fish that we've had. So she went through the whole identification process and said, yes, sir, you have a green sunfish world record. And about two weeks later, she called and she said, uh, Chip, your bragging rights just went up 50% uh, because they gave you the world's record on 10-pound test as well. How about that? A lesson on the importance of fish identification, plus a world record. Let's make Chip Drotus from Birmingham our Outdoors Club Trophy Sunfish Angler of the Week. Now it's time for a lesson in sunfish identification, at least the kinds you're likely to catch in the northern part of the United States. First of all, bluegill. Of course, they have dark bodies, dark bars, a black spot on the gill cover, 
In contrast to the smaller, brighter pumpkin seed sunfish with orange bellies and the red spot on their gill flap, then there's the green sunfish, much more bland looking than the others, but they tend to grow bigger. And a real scrappy sunfish, the red ear. It, of course, has a red mark on the gill flap, hence the name. It tends to have a dark body like the green sunfish. Now, if you get confused about that, don't worry, because the sunfish do too. They interbreed, so they come in all types of colors and configurations. But they're fun to catch and great eating. Now, when we're talking charter boat, we're talking large boat. Here's the dream weaver, Pete Rubionesis. They're all in the 30-foot class, these charter boats. Dreamweaver is the yellow one going right there. Captain Pete Rubianis, he always gets us limit catches. Behind him there is Candyman. Now that's uh, the Terry Captain Promowitz. Terry Promowitz. Uh, and there we have the Hunter. That is Captain Russ Boonstra. By Russ Boonstra. And the boat that OJ is taping on right here is Gary Monte's boat, the Champagne. And here is Gary setting the downriggers. Downriggers aren't absolutely necessary for salmon fishing, but they sure make it a lot easier. Here's a 12 pound weight that goes on the wire line that will be dropped straight down close to the bottom. They're gonna take the lures down to about 100 foot depth, 70 foot depth, 60 foot depth. Otherwise, there's no way to get these little lures out there and down that deep behind the boat without some type of weight. And the idea behind a downrigger is that the weight is, the line is clipped to a release, as soon as a fish grabs the lure, the line will pull free from that release, and you can fight the fish without hauling up that 12-pound weight. Obviously, you couldn't have weight like that uh, on your line. Makes it a much nicer battle anyway. Right. Electric downriggers taking that 12-pound weight down to which the line is clipped, running out maybe 15, 20, 25 feet of line, and I think uh, Gary is using flutter chucks, running flutter chucks this morning, a small spoon that imitates a smelt or an alewife, some of the favorite food fish of the salmon. Set the rod in the holders. There they are. This, now it's funny, on Pete's boat the first morning, they weren't hitting on the larger flutter chucks, only on the smaller ones. One of these things you just can't figure out. Maybe there were smaller alewifes down there. That's what they look like in the water. The downrigger takes that lure and puts it 60, 70, 100 feet or more down. And right here we have one of our afternoon trips. This was on Saturday afternoon. This is Roger Mellenbarger bought a trip for his family at the Channel 23 auction last spring. And he took his kids out fishing. That was Matt who just took a nice little, I don't know if that's a coho or a king. I can't tell right there. Looks sort of like a coho. Well, I tell you, those are dandy eating, Bob. Oh, on that's the just the right eating size right there. Now, Matt is uh, sort of bewildered there, but he didn't know what was coming. They're, they got two on at once. A double. That's excitement. See, you don't want those lines to cross, you don't want those fish to get tangled, or the lines to even touch, because they can, the lines can break if they cross as they're being pulled in or zipping out. But it's exciting when you get a double, or a triple, or a quadruple, like we had this past weekend. It's a fire drill on board. You can see right there, those fish are feisty. Listen to this. All right. King salmon. You know what that's called, Bob? <laughs> that's the prettiest sound in the world right there. Right. Referred to as a screamer. Listen to that Chinook salmon haul that drag out, peel the line off the reel. You worry that you're not going to have a 40-pounder that's going to strip the whole thing out and take your rod with it. But this is Rodney Mellenbarger from Okemos. He's salmon, Chinook salmon characteristically take one big, long, fast run like you just saw, and then it's it's sort of a give and take battle. Well, then it becomes work, just flat oh, out work, does. pumping them back in. And here it is, I think that, there's the big king. This, I believe, was the biggest king of the afternoon. Fish approaching the 25 pound class. Master angler minimum, of course, is 30. But that, you can tell, he's worn out. <laughs> he loved every minute of that. Rodney Mellenbarger. It almost doesn't fit in the cooler. Almost a little too long, it has to curl up. And here we have a few lake trout being caught, although the hey, salmon are suspended. We're going to explain this a little bit in the mailbag. Right. The salmon are suspended. Now, the They're maybe 30, either? 40 feet off the yeah. bottom, while the lake trout tend to be on the bottom. Yeah, but this right. one came up for one of our low running lures. That's this was nice a squid one. and a dodger. Look how close they run the squid to the dodger. Very close off Ludington. 
There's Tim Farragut. You saw him uh, heading up the handgun silhouette shooting at the outdoor fair. Just boated a nice lake trout. And here's Cindy Malski. She and Larry Malski have put together an awful lot of things for us through the Michigan Duck Hunters Association. There she catches a salmon. She's having the time of her life. I didn't realize it was that big. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> nice yeah, fish. Nice fish. My goodness. <laughs> I'll never use my left arm again. <laughs> Boy, is that beautiful. beautiful. That was a nice king. It's so much fun taking people out like this who have not caught salmon before. And so many people in the state haven't. Uh, here's Tom Hayes. He's a veteran salmon angler. He's uh, from the Houghton Lake Holiday Inn. Now, here's a friend of Zach's, my son Zach, Carol Cullum, from East Lansing, catching her first salmon. Now, this, you notice how the water has gotten rougher and rougher. I did, progressively, all weekend. And then here we are, Sunday night, in the roughest water that we had. That boat was pitching. We were actually rehearsing to take the governor out fishing, which he was scheduled to come. He would right until midnight on Sunday night. He was going to be there the next morning. Unfortunately, the Saturn announcement miffed his plans right there. We had a brief shot of our sound man, who we had to let sit out the rest of this trip. He was getting a little green around the gills. This is rough water. You can see it right there. But people who take Dramamine or just become determined they're not going to get sick, can weather through it. But look, at OJ picked up his camera off the floor, and he was having a rough time in the rough seas getting it back on his shoulder. This is why we have difficulty sometimes in the outdoors bringing you these stories. But there's my son, Zach Trost. Look at, look at that. I'll be darned. Look at that. Push the line out. Push Look at this thing. I told you we had problems in the rough weather. Uh -huh. Little video problem right here. Whoa. I don't, I don't care for this. Look at that, Zach. I don't care for it either. You don't care for that? Push the line out. Oh, my God. Lamprey, let's see if we can see. What's that? We'll ride him up for the deer. We found the tooties, Freddy. Yeah, look at where he was. Whoa. Right there. What was that? Lamprey. Where that lamprey was right there. What is on? Let me give me a flyer. Right, that thing right there. Give me the flyers. Give me the flyers. 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 These things. Are you over your sheet? I swear that thing is trying to. It's trying to get back on the fish. Here, let's get these lines. Come on, Abby. While we were catching the fish, Bob, that lamprey was, was the only lamprey or evidence of lamprey we saw in probably 150 or 200 fish that were caught in these boats throughout the weekend. <laughs> Keith didn't like hanging under that either. Huh? Here's Zach, you want to pick up your fish? Come on, pick it up. Go ahead. There's a player. Well, this is a little feel of what it's like to fish on Lake Michigan when it's calm and when it's rough. The fish can be caught, frankly, better in the rough weather, according to Pete Rubianis and the charter captains he fishes with. There's my son, Zachary, with the biggest salmon he's caught to date. A dandy in the 20-pound class. Proud of him for that. And proud of everybody who made it through, even those ones who were getting a little touchy around the gills. But there's uh, Carol Collum with the fish that she caught. Here's the catch that uh, Zach and Carol ended up with. We wanted to take them out for a good evening of fishing. That's what they got for Sunday evening when it was rougher than heck. Very few boats on the lake. But we want to thank Captain Pete Rubianis. We want to thank uh, Terry Promowitz from the Candyman, Gary Monte from the Champagne, and also Russ Boonstra from the Hunter. All of these charter captains helped us provide a great Stroh's Trophy weekend for our fishermen. And here's a surprise. Somebody you haven't seen on Michigan Outdoors in years and years. Does he look familiar? He sure does to me. Why, we did a feature with Martin F., which is going to be on later in the year, but he caught his share of salmon on Monday morning as well. We had a great time with Mort, a great time with everybody who joined us in Ludington. The weather was a little rough at times, but a good time was had by all, and this is what salmon fishing is all about in Michigan Outdoors.
Boy, what a time it was back in the mid-80s. We thought it would never stop, but unfortunately, the salmon catch by sport fishermen is down to 10% of what it was back in those days. What's the problem? Well, fisheries biologists really aren't sure. It's sort of like answering the question, what happened to the pheasants? Might be disease in the hatchery stock, we don't know. But it appears that this year is an upturn, that the fishing is better. That's a good sign, and we hope that trend continues. <laughs> Tom Bokes sent us a recipe for orange walleye. And this is a very, very simple recipe. Everything goes all into one pan, which really makes it nice. You're gonna saute some butter and pour some orange juice concentrate into it, and then add a little bit of triple sec. And he said if you don't want to use the liquor, you can use like your orange crush pop, but let it sit out so that the carbonation is out of it. And then you're going to add some salt and a little bit of garlic powder, and then some orange peel. And this is where mm. the real strong flavor of orange is gonna come through. Well, that's a sweet recipe. A very sweet recipe. And we're going to use northern pike rather than walleye. And it, everything just goes, or the fish just simmers actually in the juice. And that's all there is to this. Well, you got that northern pike, or Bob did. Uh, in Canada. In Canada. So yeah. from those clear, cold lakes, yes. the northern pike will taste a lot like walleye. Now, Tom Hendrickson, who's on our Outdoors Foundation board, you see him at the outdoor fair, helps with a lot of our activities. He's a walleye man, so he's kind of prejudiced towards, towards pike, but let's see how he likes it. Pretty good. Pretty good? Pretty good. Sweet, but pike mostly is pretty sweet. And I think the sweetness comes through from the orange juice, too. Right, I think that's where you're getting it from. And the triple sec. <laughs> Probably. Oh, yeah? Mm hmm. Hmm. Yeah, this is northern pike. Mm hmm. You can see the bones right there, the Y bones. Mm hmm. Giveaway. Yeah, if this was walleye pike, right. it would taste even sweeter. Yes. I think. You have trouble finding good pike recipes? Yeah. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> How come? Don't, um, I'm really, I do a lot of walleye fishing, so mm -hmm. I, okay, I don't. Okay, you're, you're spoiled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly, perch and walleye. That'll do it. This one adapts well, though. I think this recipe adapted real well to this. It mm -hmm. did. Yeah, I think maybe an old largemouth bass might even taste okay with <laughs> it. <laughs> Well, it's called orange walleye, but you can make it with almost any kind of fish. Why don't you try it? I think it's something the whole family will enjoy. Next week on Michigan Outdoors, we'll go perch fishing, our annual trip on the Captain Nichols party boat off South Haven. Some years we've done extremely well, other years it's been tough sledding. What about this year? Well, wait and see. We'll also review our investigations into DNR deer management, take a look at what we've uncovered earlier this year, bring us up to date on what's happened, what's coming up in deer regulations. All this and more next week right here on Public TV.